First impressions are always important in the world of professional wrestling. Yes, a great debut can make for memories that'll last a lifetime, but what were the best examples of this? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. So join us as we take a deep dive into making an entrance, wrestling's greatest debuts. And as always, if we're going to start anywhere, we should do so with one of the all-time greats, because even now, almost two and a half decades on, people are still talking about the night Chris Jericho jumped ship from WCW and proclaimed himself to be the new savior of WWF. But let's rewind a second because this debut stretched back way further than that, as during the weeks leading up to the August 9th episode of Raw that year, a countdown clock to the millennium began sporadically appearing. Of course, anyone who was paying attention would have quickly noticed this clock was not due to reach zero on December 31st. No, instead it would happen in the summer, suggesting there was something fishy afoot. As to what this was, however, well, that wouldn't be revealed until the aforementioned Monday night, because it was there, while The Rock was in the ring cutting a promo, the hourglass finally emptied. And at this point then, as it became apparent the moment had come, the lights went out and a now familiar piece of music began playing. Whose music would this be? Well, as it turned out, it was none other than one of World Championship Wrestling's top up-and-coming stars, Y2J himself. Sure, some in the audience had apparently figured out what was happening ahead of time, as can be seen in the numerous signs for Jericho in the crowd. But that didn't make the pop any less massive when his name suddenly appeared on the Titantron and the confirmation of his arrival was sealed. Really, based on the ovation alone, you can make an argument for this being the greatest debut of all time. And the future WWE Champion certainly recognized the severity of the moment as it was happening because he brought his A-game that night, standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the great one on the mic and ensuring he'd be taken seriously going forward as a result. Hell, the iconic nature of this scene made him such a star in fans' minds, it's at least part of the reason why he continues to be a main eventer to this day. That said, it's no longer in WWE where he fills this role. No, it's their chief competitors, All Elite Wrestling. And while AEW is still a relatively new company, they've been no strangers to creating legendary debuts themselves, something which can be seen in the reintroduction of CM Punk to the ring in 2021. Yes, what came after may have had mixed results for Tony Khan, but there's absolutely no denying that for one night on August 20th of that year, his company felt like it was on top of the world, but then why wouldn't it? After all, since his dramatic exit from WWE in 2014, Punk had been something of a white whale to wrestling fans, a man who'd become more myth than anything else. And that was exactly why, seven years on, his name was still frequently chanted at shows as a means of protest when the live crowd weren't happy with what they were seeing. Still though, even if they cheered for him, by the turn of the decade, the idea that he was ever going to come back felt like a near impossibility. So when rumors began circulating that he'd made a deal to return as part of the AEW roster in the summer of 2021, excitement reached a fever pitch. And that excitement reached its apex on August 20th where, at an episode of Rampage entitled The First Dance, 15,000 people packed out the United Center in Chicago to see their hero appear. Obviously then, when Cult of Personality started playing and Punk came out to the entranceway, the ovation was so catastrophic that the only thing it could really be compared to was the reaction Steve Austin got in 1998. Hell, some grown men in the crowd were actually in tears. After all, this was the prodigal son returning following a near decade-long absence. It's just a shame that while the first six months or so of his re-debut gave us classic moments like his feud with MJF, by the time it got to the summer of 2022, the CM Punk experiment had once again fallen apart amidst a sea of injuries and Mindy's bakery muffins. Will things be different if he returns again for the purported second coming in June of 2023? We'll just have to wait and see. One thing we can be fairly sure of, though, is that another return won't be happening anytime soon, as this group are now separated by companies. That said, it doesn't change the fact that when they initially debuted in 2012, The Shield were presented pretty much perfectly. That's right, in a period where WWE was at its worst in terms of creative direction, a serious boost of excitement was jolted into the proceedings when, at that November Survivor Series, three of the top up-and-coming talents in the industry, namely Dean Ambrose, Seth Rollins, and Roman Reigns, all entered the picture as a unit on the same night and quickly proceeded to destroy everyone in their path. But let's backtrack for a second because to fully understand why this was such a big deal, we need to get some information on who all of these men were at the time. 
Basically, while Roman Reigns was something of a Vince McMahon pet project, what with him being a member of the Anawaii family and all, when it came to Ambrose and Rollins, they were in no way deemed to be surefire hits on the main roster. Of course, this fact should come as little surprise though when you consider Ambrose had, up until then, been better known as John Moxley, deathmatch specialist, and Rollins had gone through a prior run as Tyler Black in Ring of Honor. So with the perceived stink of the indies on them, most expected they'd reach no higher than the mid-card once they arrived on either Raw or SmackDown. And that's why it was so exciting when, after they, along with Reigns, triple powerbombed Ryback through the announce table that night to close out Survivor Series, it was clear they were aiming for the main event, and only the main event. And as it turned out, the main event was exactly what they would get, as over the next year and a half, they absolutely dominated everyone including names such as John Cena, Daniel Bryan, and Randy Orton. Then, when all three went their separate ways in 2014, they each managed to carve out significant singles roles, significant enough to the point that as we stand today, Seth Rollins is currently the World Heavyweight Champion on Raw, Roman Reigns is riding a career-high wave as the Tribal Chief of SmackDown, and Jon Moxley is serving as the ace of AEW. Had it not been for such a perfect debut, though, none of this might have ever happened. No, there's every possibility that in a parallel timeline, the entire trio are still locked in the mid-card to this day. And The Shield aren't the only ones who have been able to ride the momentum of a great debut for a long time thereafter, because when it comes to our next subject, Kane, he was able to stay relevant for decades on the back of an all-time great first impression in 1997. Again though, like with Chris Jericho and CM Punk, part of what made this debut so effective was the build-up prior to it. What was this build-up? Well, starting in the spring of that year, Paul Bearer had started claiming to know a secret about The Undertaker, one which, if it was revealed, would destroy his career. Of course, such an accusation immediately piqued fans' interest then, so, as the weeks went on and more breadcrumbs were dropped, they continued to tune in. And in the end, this would lead to them finding out that the dead man's big secret was he had a younger brother who had, up until then, been thought to be dead. But Kane was not dead. No, as it turned out, he'd survived the fire which was believed to have killed him, and now he was ready to take revenge out on the man he blamed for starting that very fire, The Undertaker himself. Still though, the first appearance wouldn't come quite yet. No, things would be teased all throughout the summer and into the autumn, in fact, right up to the point that fans had almost started to forget about the whole thing as by then, Mark Calloway was locked into a bitter feud with Shawn Michaels. And it was while the two were taking part in the first ever Hell in a Cell match at October 5th's In Your House Bad Blood that Kane finally decided it was time to make his presence felt by costing his older sibling a big win. Yes, right at the moment audiences were least expecting it, the lights went out, and a now familiar organ sound started playing, signaling the arrival of the Big Red Machine. Following that, as he was walking down the aisle with Paul Bearer in tow, Vince McMahon gave his now iconic call of, That's, that's gotta be Kane! All before Kane himself then ripped the cell door off its hinges and entered the ring to drop his brother with his own finishing move. Really, you couldn't have asked for a more impactful debut, and that's exactly why it's still so fondly remembered to this day. In fact, you could make a solid argument that while Kane did have a lot of peaks throughout his two decade plus run, this was really the high watermark of the whole gimmick, as he never felt like more of an unstoppable killer than he did on that night. But not every debut is about making someone come across like a monster. No, on other occasions, it's just about letting a performer show his charisma off in full. And if you want a perfect example of this taking place in the modern era, you need look no further than the night Shinsuke Nakamura made his debut in NXT. Yes, on April 1st, 2016, one of the greatest wrestlers in the world made his much anticipated jump over from New Japan Pro Wrestling and, in the process, caught the attention of every hardcore fan in North America. But then why wouldn't he, because this was the man who had turned the IWGP Intercontinental Championship into a world title level belt, one big enough to main event the Tokyo Dome. And with the hopes being he'd transfer those skills right on over into an NXT ring for his initial encounter with Sami Zayn, the hype was able to reach levels which were simply unreal. Hell, by the time Zayn made his entrance that night, then from there stood in the ring and awaited his opponent's arrival, you could have cut the tension with a knife. Of course, for as beloved as the Quebec native was though, he knew fine and well he was going to be playing second fiddle to the King of Strong Style. And that's why, after Nakamura hit the ring himself with all the swagger you'd expect, Sammy gave him everything he needed in order to make the Kyoto native look like an absolute superstar. 
Not that this was necessary, however. No, Shinsuke was so charismatic it would have been impossible to make him come across like anything less than a god to the audience that night. And that's why they rained down adoration upon him throughout the bout. Adoration which helped to establish the former IWGP champion as one of the developmental brand's top stars going forward. But he wasn't the only big signing WWE had made from New Japan at this point. Hell, he wasn't even the only former IWGP champion. No, in what was seen as a major coup at the time, Vince McMahon had been able to successfully lure away not only Nakamura and the Good Brothers in one fell swoop, but also another notable figure who had a legendary debut of his own at the 2016 Royal Rumble. And that's AJ Styles. That's right, for as big of a star as Nakamura was to hardcore fans, you could argue AJ was an even bigger deal here, as he was already established in North America on account of his prior time working with TNA. So for that reason then, it was deemed best to have him skip NXT altogether and instead move straight up to the main roster following his signing, with his debut being scheduled for the Rumble match itself. And sure, we do have to point out that there was a botch which occurred during this one, because as Roman Reigns stood there alone in the middle of the ring that evening, awaiting the arrival of the number 3 entrant, the production crew managed to somehow focus on the big dog's confused face, rather than the entrance ramp when the counter reached zero and AJ made his presence felt. Still, even if this wasn't the best way to start the proceedings off, the Georgia native quickly made up for it by hitting the ring to a massive ovation from the live crowd and then proceeding to hang there with the best of them for the next half hour. And when he wasn't throwing people over the top rope, he was using his high flying skills to show everyone exactly why it had been such a terrible idea to not sign him to New York a decade before. Needless to say then, even if he was finally eliminated by Kevin Owens, by the time he got back to Gorilla, his spot was already secure going forward as Vince McMahon had now become all too aware of the level of talent he had on his hands. And this meant by the end of that same year, he'd not only have pinned John Cena clean, but he'd also have beaten Dean Ambrose to become the WWE World Champion for the first time. Would this have happened even if he didn't have a great showing during his debut? Probably. AJ Styles was always going to be too talented to ignore for long. That said, it certainly didn't hurt his stock that he impressed his bosses so quickly out of the gate. At very least, it sped up the process for him, meaning we didn't have to see him spend years unnecessarily toiling through the mid-card before he finally got his moment. But spending a period working your way through the mid-card after a big-time debut can be a good thing on occasion, as not everyone enters WWE at such an already high level of skill as the phenomenal one did. No, more often than not, when a person makes their first appearance, they're a true rookie, as was the case with John Cena when he arrived on SmackDown in June of 2002. Not that being a rookie held him back here though, no it only gave him the added hunger he needed to make an impact, and make an impact the future 16-time world champion most certainly did when he first showed up on the blue brand, because after Kurt Angle laid out an open challenge for anyone on the roster to come and test their medal against him on the June 27th episode of the show, Cena appeared and proclaimed he was ready to do just this because he had ruthless aggression. Was he ready though? Absolutely, because what followed on from here was the birth of a superstar in one night. Yes, he did lose to the Olympic hero here, but the West Newbury native put on such a good showing that management would continue to book him strong over the subsequent weeks and months and, come the end of the year, would have ultimately made the decision to run with him as their next top star. And you all know what happened after that, of course. Cena went on to become the biggest draw of his era, someone who carried the company through dark times creatively and helped to keep the kids on board throughout. Hell, at one point he was even able to use his star power to help other performers get established during their own debut, and if you want a perfect example of this in action, you need to look no further than the time when, in October of 2004, the champ helped Carlito to give a great first impression. But how did Cena do such a thing exactly? Well, by going one better than Kurt Angle did during his own debut and actually putting over the rookie. That's right, after acting completely selflessly and allowing Carlito to beat him for the United States title on his first night in the company, the champ was able to ensure that the San Juan native would be treated like a star going forward. Seriously, the closest modern day comparison to this would be when Kevin Owens made his debut in 2015, ironically to also get a win over Cena, and it was largely because of the rub Carlito was given when he first showed up here that he was able to go on a 14 match win streak, and in the process, firmly establish himself as one to watch in the future. Sure, he still had to work hard to maintain such an aura after the fact, after all a good debut can only take you so far. 
but had it not been for such a standout first impression, he may have never gotten the initial boost he needed to get himself to that level at all. And had this not happened, who knows if he would have ever gotten the pop he got when he returned to help Bad Bunny at the May 6, 2023 backlash in front of 18,000 of his fellow Puerto Ricans. Yes, if you play your cards right, a great debut can still pay off for you decades later, even when your career is already winding down. But you don't have to take our word for it when it comes to this fact. No, you only have to ask Sean Waltman because, for years, he's been able to live off of the fumes of an all-time great debut which took place when he scored a shock win over Razor Ramon in 1993. And yes, we know this technically wasn't the 1-2-3 Kids first match in WWF, as over the weeks prior he had taken part in a couple of other enhancement bouts under the names of the Lightning Kid, the Cannonball Kid, and the Kamikaze Kid. But really, few remember them now. No, the only thing they remember is what took place on the May 17th episode of Raw that year, when after being introduced simply as The Kid, Waltman stepped into the ring with Scott Hall and ended up pinning him clean in one of the biggest upsets in history. So big of an upset was it, in fact, that the 123 Kid, as he would from then on be known, became a made man overnight. And that meant entering into on screen feuds with the likes of Ted DiBiase, all while behind the scenes, he was becoming a part of the clique. The fivesome made up of him, Hall, Kevin Nash, Shawn Michaels, and Triple H, who basically ran things in New York during the mid 90s. Even now, three decades on, that magical night in 1993 still arguably ranks as Sean Waltman's greatest ever achievement, and when you take into account the fact that he is someone who was, at different points, a member of both D-Generation X and the NWO, that's a pretty bold statement to make. But again, we have to ask the question, would such success have come his way anyway, even if he hadn't had such an impactful debut? Possibly, but then it's equally as possible that without it, the future X-Pac would have just slid into irrelevance. And that's because if he didn't get such a big moment to firmly establish him with in fans' minds, it would have been a hell of an uphill battle for a man his size in WWF, regardless of whether or not he had the numbers on his side backstage. Not that the numbers game hasn't been effective on plenty of other occasions, though. No, quite the opposite, in fact, as fast-forwarding over to 2010 now, our next great debut was able to show that sometimes sheer volume and gang mentality is what you need to help yourself stand out. But then if you're a crew of eight hungry young rookies, that shouldn't come as a surprise. Yes, that's right, it's time to talk about the Nexus. And before you say it in the comments, we know this one didn't last very long. In fact, by SummerSlam of that year, following a loss to Team Cena, the rookie crew were pretty much buried beyond rescue. Still, none of what occurred later should detract from the fact that Nexus had one of the best debuts of their era, when on the June 7th episode of Raw, following a match between CM Punk and John Cena, the at that point unknown to main roster audiences ate some, jumped the barricades, and began laying waste to absolutely everyone and everything in their path. Seriously, not since the beginning of the NWO a decade and a half prior had a group made such a splash on night one. Hell, in the case of Daniel Bryan, he'd create so much controversy that he'd briefly be released altogether after a spot which featured him choking out Justin Roberts with his own tie, which was deemed too violent for the PG product. Obviously then, it should go without saying that fans were instantly drawn into this one, as for the first time in a while, it felt like WWE was going to get exciting again. Sadly though, as we all know now, that excitement wouldn't be able to maintain, because by the end of the year, five of the original members, Darren Young, Heath Slater, David Otunga, Justin Gabriel, and Michael Tarver, would be reduced to jobberdom, all while the other two, Ryback and Wade Barrett, had to spend extended periods lost in the wilderness before they could rebuild themselves in any way at all. Maybe the lesson to be learned from all this, then, is that a great debut can do wonders for a person's career, but in the end, it also has to be followed up on successfully. And if you can do that, you'll likely have a superstar on your hands for years to come.